Okay, I think we can get started. Uh, so uh, welcome to the uh, Engineers for Exploration, the E4E Summer Research Forum. So I'm Ryan Kastner, I'm one of the uh, E4E directors along with uh, Kurt Schurgers here. Um, we're excited to have you here today so we can show you some great progress that uh, the projects have been making over the summer. Um, so if you're not familiar with E4E, uh, we are a research program that developed technologies to help us better explore the world. Um, the students that work in this program, they work closely with a number of scientific mentors from different fields, uh, uh, ranging from biology to ecology, oceanography, archaeology. They work with these scientists to try to understand their challenges, and then they, uh, they work in teams to develop technologies to make it uh, more effective and efficient for the, the scientists to collect, analyze, and understand their field data. Uh, they often even go into the field with these scientists and deploy these technologies uh, alongside of them, collecting data for them and, and taking that data back and, uh, and trying to figure out what, what happened with it all. Uh, these different technologies uh, include drones, underwater depth cameras, acoustic audio recorders, software-defined radios. Uh, you hear a lot more about these uh, here in a, in a little bit. Um, so we had 35 students participating in some manner, uh, some form uh, this summer in this program. Uh, the uh, 13 of those were funded uh, by the National Science Foundation, REU site. Uh, so that's a, uh, a program that we've been running. Uh, this is our ninth year now. Um, and uh, it allows those students to work full time. So they get paid a uh, fellowship, uh, they get housing paid for, uh, and they, uh, uh, they get to work full time on, on these projects. Um, we also had a, a few uh, fellowships uh, through NSF through S for STEM um, fellows. Uh, so these are scholarships for science, technology, engineering, mathematics. Uh, targeted at low income and academically talented challenged, talented students. So uh, uh, students that uh, uh, deserve an opportunity to do some great research. Um, there are a number of students uh, from across the country. So we had a large number of course from UCSD, uh, but we also had students from Howard University, College of New Jersey, Olin, McAllister, Cal Poly, San Luis Obispo, uh, Cal State University, East Bay, Allen Hancock College, uh, and uh, probably a few others that I'm missing there. Um, so in addition to NSF, I'd like to, we'd like to uh, thank the number of other people for funding the uh, E3 program. Um, it wouldn't be possible to uh, have this run this program without uh, a number of uh, supports from these programs, largely from campus. Uh, so the computer science and engineering department, the uh, electrical and computer engineering department, the Hala Olu Data Science Institute, the Qualcomm Institute. And of course, we'd like to thank our collaborators. We had a number of scientific uh, collaborators from across the different different institutions. Um, the Scripps Institution of Oceanography at UCSD, the San Diego Zoo has been a longtime collaborator of ours. Um, uh, Tom Garrison from uh, UT Austin in archaeology. So uh, we thank them for Phil Bresnahan, Todd Marks from, from Scripps. So you'll probably see a lot of their names in the videos here in a second. So the way that this is going to work today, um, each of the project, um, we have about uh, eight to 10 projects active in engineers for exploration at any, any given time. So I think we had about that many this summer. Um, each of those will be have prepared a video and we're going to watch those videos. I encourage you to uh, make this interactive. So feel free to type uh, some questions in in the chat if you'd like or raise your hand um, after the video stops uh, or after the video plays for the project. Um, so each video is about four minutes or so, five minutes. Uh, we'll stop and uh, we'll uh, answer questions. So we'll allow the students to answer any questions that you may have typed in or you want to ask live. And I'll do my best to try to moderate that. Um, so uh, it's uh, my great pleasure again to, to have you here and to present all of this great work that the, the students have done this summer. And so uh, let's uh, get started with the videos. How many fish do you think are in the world's oceans? Millions? Billions? Try 3.5 trillion. And how many of those fish do we take out of the ocean every single year? 1.75 trillion fish, which is 50% of the global fish population. And this only accounts for fish caught legally. If we continue at this rate, our oceans will go from looking like this to something more like this. And a world that doesn't support fish doesn't support humans either. There are very few methods for effectively evaluating fish populations, and many of those methods are invasive and detrimental to fish health. 
Some current methods include by hand measurements, the use of stereo cameras, or laser calipers. All of these fail to effectively and efficiently capture fish length. This has left scientists with a lack of data making it difficult to study fish populations. UCSD's Engineers for Exploration have spearheaded this problem with the development of FishSense. With its novel and compact design, the FishSense platform contains state-of-the-art technologies to image and measure fish. By combining the Intel RealSense depth camera D455 with model machine learning algorithms, our system is able to capture fish data, providing scientists insights about fish length and biomass significantly faster than hand measurement methods. My name is Maddie, and this summer I've been working to improve the performance of FishSense by upgrading the system hardware. We have decided to upgrade the system processor from a Raspberry Pi to the NVIDIA Jetson TX2. Upgrading the processor will allow us to process images at a higher frame rate and in real time. In order to upgrade the system, processor compatibility testing was completed. The TX2 processor was flashed and connected to ConnectTech's Orbity Carrier motherboard, where it was then connected to the Intel RealSense depth camera. The RealSense SDK was downloaded and the C++ code was built and run. The system underwent various performance testing and a power analysis to confirm that the upgraded hardware is more robust. Functionality of the TX2 was investigated by accessing the TX2's GPIO pins and by SSHing into the TX2 without internet, which will make deployments run much more smoothly. Hey guys, it's Rago from the software side of FishSense. And as part of that team, that meant that I had to work on improving and integrating the model into the algorithm. That uh, improving the model entailed that I had to decrease the number of false positives, such as from rocks and debris, while also increasing the accuracy of each and every bounding box to be more tightly bounded around each individual fish. As such, here are some pictures of the old model at work, and here is the improved model at work. As, uh, as you can see, there are still some problems with some discrepancies here. But in general, the, the boxes are more tightly bounded around each and every individual fish, as well as the number of false positives is greatly decreased. With an improved model, I then worked on incorporating the depth data to make the measurement fully automatic. So the depth data is returned as a CSV as seen here. Here's that same CSV colorized. And then what I do is I take the points from the corners of each and every bounding box. And then I just use some simple Pythagorean theorem, a squared plus b squared equals c squared to find the length of the fish. So the algorithm has now spit out that the fish is about 0.35 meters, which is about one and a quarter foot. Hi, my name is Ronan Wallace. And this summer I worked on the software for fish sets. With the help of our collaborators at Scripps Institute of Oceanography, we were able to deploy our system at the Birch Aquarium, where we were able to collect a vast amount of valuable fish data. As you can see in the video, a scuba diver is handling our device, capturing both RGB and depth data simultaneously each second. With our camera, as mentioned previously, we are able to capture both RGB images and depth measurements. This allows us to detect fish and get their head to tail length and calculate biomass. From these calculations, we are able to understand fish health and population a little bit better without harming the fish or their habitat. We submitted a paper that was accepted to IEEE OES Oceans Conference for publication, detailing our device and how it works. And currently, we're writing another paper detailing our hardware and software upgrades using our newly integrated GPU, which will be submitted to the IEEE Embedded Systems Letters Journal. Thank you so much for watching. If you have any other questions, feel free to reach out to us or visit e4e.ucsd.edu for more information. Great, thanks. So uh, I didn't see any questions, but uh, this team uh, was one of the uh, one of the teams that had a couple of people or several people local. Um, so this summer uh, we got kind of at the last minute, we got uh, the ability to, to bring some people to campus, um, of course, heavily tested and following all the, the protocols that were necessary. Um, but they got to uh, go on a, a, a well, was supposed to be last week, but this week they got to go down to uh, to Mexico and go off the coast of Mexico to a 
a, a fish farm, a striped bass uh, aquaculture farm. Um, so I don't know, I think uh, maybe Ronan is here. Um, I don't, Ronan went on that uh, expedition or that trip. Do you want to say anything about what you did? I haven't even heard what they've done. So this is, uh, this yeah. is new to me as well. Yeah, absolutely. So um, basically we took our device um, and had a, a day trip down there and met with our collaborators at, at Pacifico. And they took us out to, um, out to the island. Uh, it's Isle de uh, Todos Santos. And we were able to go to their entire fish farm and understand their process um, from growing to their fish to, um, to the end uh, process processing. And we were actually able to go to their R&D um, fish cages and be able to deploy fish scents and kind of get a good idea of um, a good idea of how what works, what doesn't other improvements we want to make and kind of the direction we want to take the project. And so we have a lot of great data from that. And we're really, really excited to um, use that for further model training and uh, improving our system. Very cool, very exciting stuff. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, are there any other questions for Fish Sense team? Uh yeah, yes, I had uh, a question. Uh, I, uh, I, in the, oh, my camera, sorry. Uh, Charles Kinzel, E4E 2019. Um, hey, Charles, nice to see you. Greetings, Dr. Kasper, Dr. Sugar, it's good to see you guys. Um, I, I noticed uh, on the video that there, there, there was a, a screenshot of some fish with bounding boxes and, and then there was like a, a number uh, so, so your application, it's, it's not only measuring the fish, obviously, but it's counting the number of fish that pass through the screen. Uh, is there a part of your algorithm that accounts for occlusions? Uh, so if, if two pa fish pass, is it keeping track of those numbered fish or does it renumber them as it loses track of the fish? Uh, so I was in charge of the the bounding boxes and software side. So it goes on a frame by frame and per each frame, it counts the number of bounding boxes that it sees. So it's not, it's not tracking them because I don't know, a new fish might appear out of the, out of the background, like towards us or something. So in order to account for that, I just go frame by frame. So it does struggle a little bit with occlusions, but then like two frames later, the new fish is separated. So that's, that was my logic behind the reasoning. Got it. And if no one else, uh, I've heard of the Jetson Nano. You mentioned the TX2. Uh, how does, uh, it's an NVIDIA development kit, I'm assuming. How does that match up to the Nano? Or, or maybe just, does it have, uh, how many GPU cores does it have? Yeah, the, the TX2 is uh, definitely an upgrade from the Nano. Um, it has a higher higher speed processor. Um, and it's double the cores GPU, so 256 as opposed to 128. Cool. Wow. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Great. Thank you. I think we can move on now to the to the next project. Hi, my name is Jacob Ayers. I am the current project lead for the Automated Acoustic Species Identification Team at the Engineers for Exploration Lab at UC San Diego. So right now it is uh, 1 a.m. and I as a project lead and person, I had a bit of an epiphany. I realized that being one of the lead programmers on my team uh, this year, I am not going to be able to put in quite the amount of time and effort into a video project like I did during uh, RU 2020. Uh, I realize I'm going to shoot a different type of video this year. My goal is to show off what it's like to do research in the RU program, specifically in my lab. I and mean, hopefully I get to show off, you know, what sort of technical contributions I make, what it's like leading a team, what it's like to be an aspiring researcher. And um, now I'm going off script and just gonna see how just film myself 
on a daily basis and tie it all together at the end through the magic of editing. We'll see how this goes. Today, I am leading an expedition to the Scripps Coast Reserve. Uh, we're going to fill this area with audio recordings that will record for two weeks. And so, man, being someone that has that grew up watching a lot of documentaries and stuff like Zabumafu, uh, Steve Irwin, and David Attenborough documentaries, it's really cool having grown up watching people go out into the field and listen to animals uh, and such. It's really cool to have an opportunity to, to, you know, be in those shoes. Hello. Yesterday, um, Sean Perry and Mugen Blue, my two teammates, uh, they went out to the Scripps Coastal Reserve with me and we went around and took latitude and longitude coordinates of where we believe that we can set up low-cost audio recorders to record bird songs. We're kind of developing two pieces of software concurrently. The collaborators requested we create an audio labeling system with a couple of different requirements, make it web-based, make it so they label on a spectrogram, see if we can implement some basic user tracking, like how long it take them to annotate stuff. Ryan was saying you should really start thinking of how to combine the different stuff you've been working on into, you know, a coherent package. And so I, <laughs> I may have taken that too literally and was like, well, I'll write a Python package. And so basically that led to what I called an automated audio labeling system and a manual audio labeling system. Uh, and so Sean Perry, since I don't have the web development skills, he's been primarily leading that. I've acted more as a kind of hands-off manager that just kind of looks at the final product and says, uh, yeah, this is good, maybe make these tweaks, uh, and then, like, how can I make this labeling system complement what I'm doing? My real hope is that by the end of summer we'll have the automated audio labeling system, PIHA, and the audio labeling system, Pyronote, be able to kind of synchronize together well enough that once we have gone out and actually deployed the audio moss and retrieved them two weeks later, we'll be able to actually parse through that data in, in an efficient manner. Today is our first uh, actual deployment day, not the first day on the coastal reserve, but first time we're deploying audio moths as a team, which is super exciting. Here we have our eight audio moths all lined up. And we're going to go onto the field. We took GPS coordinates, and so now it's just a matter of using the same app to return to them. So, right now I am outside of Center Hall at UCSD. And I chose this spot because just under two years ago, I came up to Kurt Sugars after his EC15 lecture and had expressed my interest in Engineers for Exploration. Uh, I knew I wanted to get involved in climate change and conservation research, and I wanted to apply my skills in computer science. At this time, though, I had never ever made a machine learn or processed any signals. Just today, I finished uploading over 300 hours of audio that contains an endangered species called the California gnatcatcher. It's a great feeling to have walked in the footsteps of many of my conservationists that I look up to. I hope that the tools we have developed over the summer, you know, PIHA and Pyre Notes, can be used for future conservation efforts and help make species such as the California gnatcatcher be heard. Fantastic. Um, so uh, I don't, if there's any questions, I'll lead off with another question too. So you all just uh, you kind of alluded to it in the in the video, but just uh, just collected a bunch of audio moths. Uh, uh, also a fairly local uh, expedition, but uh, a good one that, nevertheless. Uh, you want to talk a little bit about that and what your plans are for the next steps there? Yeah, so I think 
part of, I think a lot of this was motivated um, due to just general supply chain shortages. So they had an opportunity to purchase these audio moth recorders that our collaborators have used. And we, um, we don't know how many opportunities in the near future we're going to get to purchase them. So we just kind of went ahead and bought some and it's like, okay, we bought them. Now we have to use them. Okay. What's the closest place to, uh, what's the best local place to deploy them? And so that was actually on Nathan, Nathan Huiz, our staff engineer's suggestion. He was like, you should probably check out the Scripps Coastal Reserve. So we had to go through like this uh, res reservation process and, but they were, you know, Isabel K. she was super helpful in the entire process. And, um, and so we got 10 audio moth devices and we set them out to record about one minute every 10 minutes for two weeks. And um, as for next steps, uh, there, it turns out that there is um, a group of ornithologists that tour the Scripps Coastal Reserve once every month. And, um, and so I started talking to them about like the work we're doing related to, uh, you know, automatically segmenting bird vocalizations and classifying um, species. And they seem interested in that. So the hope is that we can get them to label some of our audio data and, um, and test out, you know, the PHA and Pirate Note systems that we have. Um, yeah, and if uh, any of my teammates want to add in any notes, um, go for it. Other questions? Okay, if not, I think we can head on to the next project. On the picturesque Lakipia Plateau of Kenya, Dr. Shirley Strom has been studying several troops of baboons for nearly five decades. One of her aims is to better understand their collective decision making. With troop sizes varying between 20 to over 150 individuals, it can be hard to keep track of both group level and individual level movement trajectories, particularly since the baboons prefer rough terrain and large boulders as sleeping sites. To improve her logistical ability to track multiple animals, she reached out to the team at Engineers for Exploration, where we set to work using drone footage to get a bird's eye view of the entire troop, unlocking information about baboon behavior that has not previously been available. We've processed this information by using a custom algorithm to remove foreground baboons from their background. To do so, we start with a set of previous or historical frames. Using the current frame as a reference, we adjust the historical frames to match the reference frame. The adjusted frames are then combined using an intersection algorithm. The intersections are then unioned together, generating a single reference of what the background should look like. This reference background is compared against the current frame to extract the moving baboons. We can then convert each baboon into a single centroid using blob detection. The output centroid of the blob detection represents the results of our motion detector. This motion detector provides an effective basis for tracking baboons. We've explored other possible solutions, like applying deep learning based object detection, but these methods prove to be less effective than background subtraction based motion detection. This is largely because baboons are difficult to identify even for humans without picking them out through their movement across frames. This is largely because baboons are very small relative to the resolution and field of view of the image, often taking up less than 1% of the frame, and because they have a very similar color to the ground and brush. Although the motion detector is a good starting point, it presents a number of problems when used on its own that need to be rectified before it is accurate enough to be usable by our research partners. These problems were the main focus of our work this summer. The first and most significant issue is that the motion detector will not identify baboons that are not moving, even for a small percentage of the time. The detector will also not pick up baboons that are occluded by trees or underbrush. Finally, there is still a small but notable amount of noise after the frames are transformed to overlap. In terms of usability, the algorithm's Python implementation is prohibitively slow and can take a few seconds to process each frame. 
Our main approach to solving the stationary baboon's occlusion and noise has been through the use of a class of techniques collectively termed Bayesian filtering. Specifically, we implement and test a particle filter and a Kalman filter-based approach to baboon tracking. Our particle filter works by comparing the expected positions and directions of our baboons to the bounding boxes that the background subtraction algorithm has identified. A certainty value is then calculated using intersection over union to characterize the dissimilarity between the theoretical and actual position of the baboons, at which point we take up baboons that don't meet a specified probability threshold and repeat the process for each frame for the duration of the footage, causing the baboon particles to slowly converge onto the baboon's position. This is a simple and direct approach which makes it attractive. The particle filter helps us track baboons better than we could before when stationary and occluded baboons run tracks. But when trying to implement the particle filter, we found that the filter didn't adequately track baboons that have moved. This causes the filter to continuously add new baboons to the frame. To correct this, we intend to review the calculation for our certainty value to ensure that it more accurately identifies the same baboon frame to frame. Our alternate solution is a Kalman filter. This uses a simple baboon motion model to predict the movement of the baboons each frame. The smaller and further away the bounding box is from the predicted location of the baboon, the less we trust the bounding box. This is less computationally intensive than the particle filter, but has many of the same benefits. It can track stationary baboons and reduce noise. In practice, our Kalman filter was very successful, it has no problem tracking stationary baboons and successfully rejects small amounts of noise from the background subtraction. The main drawback of the Kalman filter is that it requires the user to indicate the number and the initial locations of the baboons. This is not an inherent limitation of the Kalman filter. We could use a heuristic to identify the initial positions of the baboons. But it does make the filter more robust and easier to implement. We think the small amount of human intervention is a reasonable trade-off for higher accuracy. We explored a number of methods for denoising the input image, but most of them did not yield significant difference in results. Our algorithm originally operated on a grayscale image, but we tried feeding in the red, green, and blue color channels instead. We found that while the performance of the blue and green channels were similar to grayscale, the red channel produced more false positives. We tried using hue, saturation, value as well, and we'd like to continue considering more ways that we can mix the blue and green channels to produce better results as these were the best performing color channels. Because the original Python implementation of our background subtraction algorithm was quite slow, we re-implemented it in C++ and added GPU acceleration to get a more than 10 times speed up on a Jetson Nano over the original Python implementation. Because of this performance increase, it is now possible to use it in the field without waiting significant amounts of time for it to process data. Our next steps involve adding a user-friendly interface so that the algorithm is readily accessible to our researchers. We'd also like to acquire more data to test our algorithm. Even though there is more work ahead of us, our progress this summer substantially improved the accuracy and runtime performance of our methods. And we believe we are much closer to the point where our work is ready to be deployed and used to help scientists in the field. Another great job. So I don't know if uh, the baboon team knows this, but um, I think sh uh, Shirley uh, mentioned that she's retiring this year or sort of semi-officially at retiring, uh, focusing more on, on the research. Um, but uh, there is talk of National Geographic doing a uh, uh, some sort of, I don't know, press or show on, on her career uh, at, the, at that uh, in Kenya. So, uh, and they definitely would continue on. Um, so she's hopeful or I'm excited to, to have the team or parts of the team go hopefully to Kenya um, sometime next year. Uh, so hopefully that will happen and you get to not just take all those cool videos that they did, but actually go there and, uh, and see, see the baboons and count them for yourselves. Any questions for the, for the baboon team? Uh, yes, I had one. Um, so uh, you mentioned that to uh, to track the baboons it required a bit of human inver intervention. And that was that on the first frame, you, I guess you marked the baboons that you wanted to track. Um, is that the first frame in, in any video that's being processed? Can you, or is that a relative first frame? Can you stop, can you stop the video or something and, and mark them then, or is it just one shot uh, kind of thing? Yeah, you, um, if you mean to ask, like, is it possible to later correct it? Absolutely. Yeah, it, it's totally possible. 
uh, and, and very easy to make it so that the user can go and change an incorrect uh, uh, baboon position estimate. And then that will be taken into account on uh, in later frames. So, so that's possible and, and definitely something that, you know, we, we haven't developed like a user interface yet, but something that would be part of that user interface. Thank you. And any, so in the past year or a couple of years for this project, we had uh, significant challenges and, and just it took forever to run those videos. Those videos were really high frame rates, but we needed the, you know, the high resolution because the, the bad ones are so tiny. So any, uh, any insight onto what really kind of made that almost real time now, that was a really big improvement that we had this summer. So can you talk a little bit more about how you did that? Yeah. Um, the nice thing about the algorithm is that almost almost every step up until the really the very last step where you um, extract contours from the video can be performed relatively easily on the GPU. So, so there, there's a lot of, one thing is there's a lot of operations which are either masking or um, comparisons. And so doing comparisons or element wise, effectively bitwise operations on all the pixels uh, is pretty easy. The other thing is um, there's it. We can set it up so that there's very little. Um, uh, we don't have to allocate new memory for each frame because it's a fair amount of memory. We can actually do almost everything in place. The other thing is that this wasn't a design in the original Python implement, implementation, but when re-implementing it, it, it was kind of from scratch. Um, it was easy to make it so that each run of you know each run of the pipeline on each frame could be totally kind of separate, so we could run it in multiple threads. So all of those together um, <clears throat> really contributed to a significant performance increase. To kind of add, add to that, the um, the original Python implementation, uh, while it used NumPy in its in its blahs backends. Um, it was limited to the number of the Python implementation itself was it was and is single threaded um, and does not run does not run any of the actual video processing in parallel. That that said, Blas is capable of running various of these uh, matrix computations in parallel on on the on uh, multiple CPU threads. So we do get some benefit there. Uh, so I think one of the biggest things that kind of comes out of this is we switched from using my uh, 16 core CPU to uh, to where we run on the Jetson Nano for uh, 128 cores and uh, ho hopefully even an even better speed up when we run on um, the, the GPU in my computer with a with a thousand or a thousand two hundred eighty. Uh, course, so I, so to kind of like really express the increased ther throughput that a lot of that basically by using CUDA by using uh, C plus plus we've been able to unlock because we've been able to do this stuff in uh, parallel. Great, thanks, Chris. Dickel. Any other questions? And feel free to use the chat if you're if you don't want to uh, to chime in. Um, chat is a very easy way to, uh, to ask some questions. So please use that at any time. All right, so let's continue on to the next project. Thank you, Baboon Team. Hi, everyone. My name is Nathaniel Eastloss. I'll be presenting the Burring Owl classification project I worked on this summer at the Engineers for Exploration. A little bit about myself. I'm a senior at California State University, East Bay, studying computer science and statistics. So how did this project start? The engineers of explorations, scientific collaborators at the San Diego Zoo wanted to better study the western burring owl because the local population is rapidly declining and at risk of going extinct in San Diego County due to habitat loss. The plan they devised to monitor and study these owls was to set up camera traps near owl burrows around San Diego. 
To the right is an actual picture captured by a camera trap. The owls inhabit burrows that are mainly dug by ground squirrels, as well as prairie dogs and even tortoises. So, how are we contributing to their efforts? The problem that the researchers encountered is that the camera traps work as designed to capture an image at any sign of movement. However, this results in a large amount of images that are not necessarily of interest to the researchers since they don't have owls in them. Last year, E4E started working on a solution to this problem by developing a machine learning pipeline to automatically label the camera trap images. This summer, I worked on the system in which the researchers could easily interact with to have their data labeled. The project lead, Justin, wanted the system to be simple to use with little input required of the user. Essentially, the system would prompt the user to input the folder's file path that contains their data. Each file would then be fed through the machine learning pipeline, and the images that have an owl are organized in a new filtered images folder, along with a CSV of the projection results for each image. There are a few steps in the pipeline to detect the presence of an owl in an image. The first is that the folder of images is sent to a detection model that provides the coordinates of bounding boxes around objects of interest. In the second picture, we see what one of those bounding boxes looks like around the two owls. This step increases the accuracy of the owl classification model. The second step crops an image to create a sub-image to be analyzed by the owl classification model. The third step analyzes the sub-image passed to the classification model. If the cropped image is predicted as being an owl, then the entire image is classified as owl. If there are multiple cropped images for an image and at least one owl, we predict owl for the overall image. Here we have an example of the system's output. We see the main filtered images directly on the left, which contains two subdirectories that I tested the system with. The subdirectories are organized according to the file name of the original folder processed by the system. Each subdirectory contains images, the model predicted the presence of an owl, and a CSV with the prediction results for all images in a folder. On the right is an example of the prediction results for a folder. It contains information on the file name, whether or not there was an owl, and the minimum number of owls detected. Overall, I was successful in creating a system that was easy to use and that will hopefully be of much help to our scientific collaborators. That is all for my presentation. Thank you so much, and a special thanks to Dr. Kastner, Dr. Frugers, and my project lead, Justin. Thank you. So uh, in terms of uh, the challenges that you faced, uh, Nathaniel is here, I hope. Uh, otherwise, I'm just going to ask this to no one, huh? Uh, yes, oh, yes. Excellent. All right, good. I didn't check before I asked this question. So uh, what what, uh, what, were your, what were your toughest challenges uh, uh, that you faced this summer when doing this project? Uh, so um, the pipeline kind of involved, or involved uh, a few different um, models that they had found. Uh, one of the ones was a uh, mega detector, which is uh, a model developed by Microsoft for conservation efforts. Uh, and it's kind of the same use as what we needed it for. It would draw bounding boxes around images or around objects of interest for an image. Um, yeah, so getting that to work with the rest of the model is kind of uh, difficult just because there are different processing steps. Um, and also just the, the the differences in uh, the libraries they were using and what we were using. Um, yeah, and I was really trying to focus on uh, making the the output for the researchers uh, well organized because um, I noticed that all the folders that they had their data in were organized by location um, and I think even different camera traps. So I, I was kind of very meticulous about that. 
great. Yeah, that's really important. Uh, over often overlooked as well, I think, in, in computer science is uh, making sure that uh, things are easy to understand and organized well and uh, documented well. All right, thanks, uh, Nathaniel. Let's go on to the next project. The ocean is a magnificent place, home to a majority of all life on Earth and covering over 70% of the Earth's surface, there's always something to learn from the sea. The definitions of coastline vary, but it is agreed that hundreds of thousands of miles of coastline exist on the Earth. Scientists believe that if all of the wave energy along the coastlines of the world is harnessed annually, it could satisfy the entire world's electricity for that time period. Understanding the ocean could lead to scientific developments in many different fields. However, there is a lack of resources available to provide measurements near the coastline. The SmartFin is a solution to that issue. The SmartFin is a longboard surfboard fin that is capable of gathering much data through its sensors including if it is in the water or not, the temperature of the water that it's in, its location, and acceleration. From these sensors, we will be able to reduce much other information, such as wave height. With the SmartFin, scientists will be able to gather dense data from many beaches, produce more accurate wave height and water temperature forecasts, find out where, when, and how long people are surfing, and more. Through experiments conducted by the San Diego Strip Pier, we have been able to compare the SmartFin's temperature readings with those of the pier, and also analyze its GPS sensors. In the future, we will compare wave height readings determined by the SmartFin's accelerometer and algorithms to the pier's wave height readings as measured and analyzed through its pressure sensor. The data we got from the SmartFin was in an encrypted format, as you can see here. We had to implement a decoder in Python, which was able to produce our data in a table. We also further optimized our decoder by incorporating data analysis methods. Therefore, we were able to graph things such as temperature histograms and temperature over time and GPS sensor measurements. Our SmartFin produces inertial data, such as acceleration, gyroscope, and magnetometer. We are currently working on determining the exact position of the SmartFin. In order to get position, we would need to double integrate our acceleration. And along with that, coupled with citizen science, there comes a lot of noise in our data. Therefore, we're in we are implementing a Kalman filter, which uses linear values from our sensors to predict the exact position of our fin. This flowchart right here represents our programming logic, and we hope to add more angular measurements, such as gyroscope data and heading to our program. So far, we have values for our transition matrices, and we have working code on Jupyter Notebooks for these linear values. And we will be optimizing this with process noise, and we will also work on common smoothening in the future. We are using spectral analysis to determine the wave height from our acceleration data. Spectral analysis is a function that provides information about how power is distributed by analyzing the frequency domain of a function. A common filter will determine the vertical displacement, which spectral analysis will then process into wave height. Fourier transforms are used to show the frequency domain of a function in the time domain or vice versa. It's very useful for sine functions, which are what we use to represent waves. As you can see below, there is a combination of sine functions expressed as a few frequencies in the frequency domain. We currently have code that is capable of taking C-dip vertical displacement and producing accurate significant wave height graphs. And we are using HM0 as opposed to HS. HS is the average height of the top one third of the waves. HM0 is a little bit more complicated than that. It involves an integral. None of the work we accomplished would have been possible without E4E and our amazing supervisors Ryan Kastner, Kurt Jurgers, and Nathan Huey. Thanks to their involvement and the help of our team, shown in the picture above, we were able to accomplish much this summer and will accomplish much more in the future. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So uh, why don't you tell us about what you hope to accomplish in the future? Someone is there. I saw Nick and Valley. Oh, I 
but uh, yeah, basically this summer we, you know, um, we had a lot of data that we got from our smart bin earlier. So we built on uh, analyzing that data. And like we mentioned in the video, we worked on common filters uh, to help like reduce noise in all of our data and get better estimates of the position. And uh, with regards to spectral analysis, I think Nick and uh, Ted and other, other team members have been working on that. So he can expand on that. Yeah, for spectral analysis, Nima, would you like to speak about that? Um, sure. So for our spectral analysis, we're able to work with CDIP data, but we need to be applying this more to um, our actual data collected by SmartFin. So we weren't really in San Diego and weren't able to do too much like actual testing. But um, with the CDIP data we have, we're able to apply different windowing functions to make our um, HMO, as was said in the um, in the presentation more and more accurate and, and similar to um, the significant wave height that CDIP is calculating. And so as we try more and more windowing functions and um, I mean, explore more ways to analyze the data, we can hopefully get this to be extremely accurate um, next year, or I don't know how the timeline goes, but soon. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Thank you. All right, so let's, I think we have two more. So let's continue on, please. For the conservation and management of animals and their natural habitats, the use of radio telemetry tracking is a common and reliable method. E4E's radio telemetry tracking project started in 2013 as a collaboration with the San Diego Zoo's Wildlife Alliance. Because traditional methods of tracking animals on foot are time consuming and physically taxing, the radio telemetry tracking team worked to produce a drone based system that was intuitive and user friendly. This project has had deployments on the island of Little Cayman and Big Ambergris Cay in the Turks and Caicos Islands. This summer, we have collaborated with Dr. Matthew Gifford at the University of Central Arkansas, who wants to track common collared lizards. They want to track common collared lizards in a fixed area and produce results every 10 minutes. And because they want results so frequently, having a drone fly every 10 minutes is not a viable option due to time constraints and battery limitations. Our current proposed solution is to develop a system of stationary towers to track the lizards, as this would allow for a more long-term setup. One method proposed to implement in our system is a time difference of arrival or TDOA technique. With TDOA, we have a transmitter broadcasting a signal and multiple receivers picking up that same signal. Because we know that electromagnetic waves travel at about the speed of light, we can use the differences in time between when each receiver picks up the same signal to estimate where the transmitter is located. One of our largest challenges with TDOA is timing synchronization. This is because before we can compare timing between received signals, we must first ensure that our systems are properly synchronized, otherwise our results will be skewed. In order to find the time delay between the systems, we can use one of the receivers as a beacon and have it send a pulse to the other receivers. We can then later align the signals with that received pulse to be able to properly time signals received from the transmitters. Spatial accuracy using TDOA can be approximated using the equation distance equals speed of light times time synchronization error. Our system uses a sampling rate of about 2 MHz, and because of this, without subsample synchronization, we can only achieve a spatial accuracy of 150 meters. Using binary search technique, we are able to achieve subsample accuracy between two identical time offset signals which would theoretically allow for less than one meter accuracy. However, in reality, noise and differences in signal strength are certain factors that must be dealt with. So moving forward, our team will work towards a more robust synchronization solution. In the future, we have several collaborations and deployments planned. Along with tracking common collared lizards in Arkansas, we plan on collaborating with Gus Calderon at Airspace Consulting and the LA Zoo to track pandas with the drone-based system in Chengdu, China. There is also opportunity to track iguanas in the Turks and Caicos Islands during summer of 2022, which will also be a drone-based system. Great. 
Great, thanks, Mia. So um, I think I'll ask probably this a very similar question that I asked last time. So what were the, the challenges that you faced this summer? Because we had this existing project that we've been using for a long time on a drone for localization, but then we had this new opportunity for the more stationary tracking. So expand a little bit on, on, on what you had to do in order to change the system for that. Uh, yeah, so um, we considered a couple um, model changes. So our drone system uses a um, received signal strength indicator um, model and so um, RSSI. So uh, we had, we have the option to either use an RSSI model or we were looking into seeing if the TDOA model could work out. So um, most of my, so we started out with um, like simulating for TDOA um, and our biggest issue so far has been dealing, finding a solution that is sensitive to noise um, or that is resistant to noise. Um, there, we had an issue finding a whole lot of like literature on um, this sort of subject. I, normally the um, solution to getting a um, low time synchronization errors to um, getting equipment that can have a higher sampling rate, which um, is a very expensive solution. So we were trying to find a more um, signal processing solution. So uh, that has been most of my, um, that has been the largest challenge that I've faced this summer is trying to get past that. Um, it seems like going forward, we may um, just focus on an RSSI based solution and then um, maybe explore TDOA later when we have a bit more um, bandwidth and people working on it. So we'll see. Great. And you want to talk real quickly about the, the panda tracking with the zoo? That was a, another exciting thing that came up this summer. Oh, yeah. Um, we actually, uh, Gus had just dropped off the drone yesterday. It's huge. Um, <laughs> it's like 15 pounds without the batteries. Uh, yeah, so uh, Gus uh, contacted um, us and Nathan about his um, thesis. Uh, Gus specializes in um, creating um, drones. And uh, previously, I believe uh, they, him and the people that he worked with have focused on like cinematography and like making documentaries. Um, and so he, it's been working with um, the LA Zoo to track these pandas in China. And um, they seem to have a like tracking solution already sort of um, working. So uh, a lot of in the future or in the more immediate future, I'll be helping them with UI changes, but we also have plans to um, set up our system and test it on the drone. Uh, so. That's very exciting. Great, thanks, Mia. And I see Trong, uh, Professor Nguyen, uh, asked a question about publications and presentation venues. Um, so um, we encourage all everybody, and we talk a lot about publications. Um, there's, I think, maybe twenty or thirty that we've had over the years, and in, in a number of different places. Uh, some are are you focused or research undergrad focused? Others are. Um, for instance, Oceans uh, was a conference that we had a publication from this summer with some of the students. Um, and so I believe they're on the website somewhere. I'll try to find the link, uh, but you can see uh, the, the publication so far to date that we've had. And hopefully a few more from this summer that the, the students are focusing on. Okay, um, one more project, I think, and then uh, Kurt will, will take us home. Uh, thank you, Jacob, for putting that link in there. Eye eyes are a species of lemur found native to the island of Madagascar. A specifically famous eye eye is Maurice from the movie Madagascar. However, since 2016, these adorable creatures have been endangered as a result of habitat destruction and hunting. They were actually killed in some areas due to the belief of harboring evil and bad luck. 
Now, IIs are not only protected under the law, but some are maintained and nurtured in closed captivities, such as at the San Diego Zoo Safari Park. In the fall of 2020, the San Diego Zoo Institute for Conservation Research reached out to engineers for exploration. In order to promote the overall health of the IIs, the goal of this collaboration is to determine the variations in their sleep patterns through the use of a sensor network and data analysis consisting of various computer vision and machine learning techniques. This sensor network is non-invasive and will be placed around the IIs enclosure and so having minimal impact on the animals. If pilot deployment in the II enclosure shows good results, the future system may be deployed across the entire zoo to monitor the other species in their care. This sensor network is composed of four units, the remote sensor unit, the on-box unit, the data server, and the router. The remote sensor unit consists of an IP camera, Raspberry Pi, and a screen. And as seen by the red figure representing the general field of view of the camera, this unit will be utilized to view the entire II enclosure. Next, the on-box unit is composed of two boxes. This box, located on the top of the II's nesting box, is composed of a Raspberry Pi, Arduino Nano BLE Sense, Pi infrared camera, and microphone. It is important to note that for the sake of demonstration, the components are displayed floating in the box. However, there is a 3D printed housing unit to support them. In this box, on the side of the nesting box, there is a screen. And this represents the conduit housing the power and HDMI cables between the two on-box enclosures. The screen, as well as the other one in the remote sensor unit, will be utilized by zookeepers to periodically monitor the sensor network and video streams. In regards to the types of data and how they would flow, there are two sources of video streams, the IP camera and the Pi infrared camera. There are also two sources of audio data from the Pi microphone and Arduino Nano BLE Sense PDM microphone. Along with the microphone on the Arduino Nano, it will also capture IMU or inertial measurement unit data such as acceleration, gyroscopic, and magnetic field data. This summer of 2021, the II sleep monitoring team is completing an initial model of the system and sensor network. Each of our team members have collaborated and worked hard on various components such as configuring the graphical user interface for the screens, managing data classes, building II proof housing units for the electronics, and testing potential computer vision techniques like optical flow and background subtraction to use in the future. As of this September, we are planning to run a pilot development of the completed system in the San Diego Zoo's Conservation Research Lab for a few weeks. After testing, the system will be deployed in the II enclosures. Thank you for watching. If you wish to learn more about this project, you can contact Katie Miyamoto, myself, Amazing, or you can visit the E4E website for more information. Right. Great job. So uh, can you tell us a little bit more about when you think you're going to get your technology into the zoo? Of course. Um, we right now are a lot of things kind of have changed a lot, even like from the video itself. I won't go into that. But um, we are planning on doing like a live demo for Ian specifically and just to make sure that the whole system itself is working. So that'll be in C Lab on campus. September 8th is what we're planning and then would you like Katie would you like to explain who Ian and C lab and what those I'm things are so sorry oh my god <laughs> no, yes of course um so Ian was one of the people in the video you saw and he is our um collaborator or our advisor from the San Diego Zoo and he's a senior researcher there so he is um the one I guess 
asking for this project in a sense, and he's working with us really closely and he's been really amazing and fun to work with. Um, and so we're gonna work with him for a live demo just to make sure that the system's working and data is flowing appropriately. Um, so that'll happen second week of September. And then two weeks after that, we're planning on placing the system in his lab for further testing. Um, and then after that, and after we debug it and fix it and make it even more perfect, hopefully it'll be going into the enclosure. So we still have a bit of a way, <laughs> but we're getting there. <laughs> so, yeah. Great, great job, Katie. Thank you. I don't think May, May is here, but uh, good job. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Kurt, I think that's it. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, I wanted to uh, kind of invite everyone to give a virtual applause for, uh, for all our students. Um, and I mean, they did an amazing job. I really enjoyed all the videos, um, but just beyond the videos, I mean, everyone did an amazing job this, uh, these past 10 weeks. Um, especially given all the, all the challenges, right? So this was kind of a remote slash hybrid program and everyone had to work with uh, basically just like last minute changes or work remotely. I mean, this is not easy, right? And, and, and hopefully you kind of appreciate like how much they were able to accomplish um, despite all these challenges, right? Coming on campus like last minute, having to, having to basically work together to these Zoom meetings. Um, and hopefully it also shows like what is possible, right? If, if you have dedicated students who really are willing to work hard at this. So, um, so definitely thank you for all the, to all the participants this summer. Um, absolutely super impressive. Uh, you're setting the bar really high for next year. Um, so so if, if there's anybody here who plans to apply next year, uh, you see, um, what, what, this, what this program do and what, what we challenge you to do. Um, I would also like to thank again uh, all our, uh, our sponsors, all the people who have provided support, all the, our, all the collaborators, um, the ones that were mentioned and the ones uh, in, in the videos and the ones um, who are supporting projects that weren't featured this summer. Um, we really appreciate all your support. Um, we, we can't do this without you. And, and um, hopefully you realize kind of what kind of an impact you're making, not just in your field, but also uh, for these students here and, and, and for these future engineers and computer scientists, and hopefully also people who um, will change the world for the better, right? Through technology and, and, and through their skills. So, so thank you for that. And thank you um, for, uh, for being here with us and showing interest in these projects. Uh, and I would, like to invite you to, to stay engaged, to stay involved. So um, if, if you are uh, somebody who has a problem or you feel like this, this fits within engineering for exploration, please contact us, right? Please talk to us. Um, if you feel like this fits within kind of something that you may want to collaborate or sponsor or, or fund or, or whatever, um, if, um, if this is of interest, just reach out to us, reach out to the project leads. We're always looking for more ideas. We're always looking for more collaborators. Um, and if, if you or, or your friends are interested in joining as, as, as students, if, if you want to work on these projects, please, please advertise. We're always, we always have um, positions open. We will do uh, a recruiting push um, at the start of the quarter. And we do one at the start of every quarter. So um, we really want to kind of bring these opportunities to as many students as possible. Um, and so that requires a lot of, a lot of work, a lot of, a lot of engagement from, from collaborators, from students. Um, and, but if you're, if you're asking if you can help as well, you definitely can and you can be involved. So, uh, so please reach out and um, yeah. So that's basically what I want to say. Thank you all. Um, there's a, there's a lot of moving parts here, and these these amazing projects can't happen without all of you. So yeah, thank you. Um, and I don't know if there's any last questions or any last words, but um, I hope uh, you enjoyed these videos as much as I did, and uh, we will uh, hopefully see you later.